session to start. Um, a deal, I'd like to pass it over to you at this point. Great, thanks so much, Paul. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us uh, today to uh, this uh, Columbia, Leaders, uh, Columbia Leaders experience. Um, Kale is a series of virtual programs that's designed to provide leadership development, as well as collaboration and camaraderie among alumni volunteers. My name is Adil Ahmed. I'm a business school alumni class of 2012, uh, co-president of the Alumni Club of Vancouver and a member of the Columbia Alumni, Columbia Alumni Association Board. Uh, I'm also part of the Associations and Clubs KL Subcommittee, which is a group of 20 alumni leaders from around the world uh, who have worked over the last couple of weeks and months to ensure you have a wonderful KL experience. We thank you for volunteering and leadership with the CAA Regional Alumni Clubs and also the shared interest groups. We also wanna thank you this morning for joining uh, Kale over the last five weeks. Um, make sure not to miss the closing session this Saturday at 10 a.m. We have some very special speakers, the Honorable Madeline Albright, uh, 68 GSAS, 76 GSAS, 95 uh, uh, Honor. Uh, former US Secretary of State Lee Bollinger, 71 Law, President Columbia University, as well as Lisa Carnoy, 89 CC, University Trustee, Chief Financial Officer of Alex Partners. We'll also host three additional bonus kale trivia nights on Thursday, November 12th at 8 p.m. Singapore time, which is 7 a.m. Eastern time uh, by the Columbia Alumni Association of Singapore, uh, as well as Saturday, November 21st at 4 p.m. Uh, GMT London time. That's 11 a.m. Eastern time by Columbia University Club of London and at 5 p.m. Eastern time by Columbia SoCal and the Alumni Club of Boston. So I'm very excited this morning to uh, introduce our presenters for today's session. We have uh, Joanna Socha, 15 Journalism, uh, the president of the Columbia Alumni Association of Poland, and also uh, Mariam Hassan, who is a 20CC and co-founder of the Columbia Al Arab Alumni Association, both who are eager to share their insights with you today. Uh, Joanna Socha, 15 Journalism, is the president of the Columbia, Lab, Cl Columbia Club of Poland. Joan is a founder and editor in chief of W Insight. She oversees the editorial and creative sides of the website. Uh, Joan is a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and president of the Columbia Club of Poland. Joanna is based in Warsaw, Poland and you can follow her on Twitter um, at J-O-A underscore S-O-C. Miriam Hassan, uh, 20CC, in her time at Columbia, was a two-time captain of the varsity women's track team, the co-chair of the Arab Middle Eastern Family Tree in the Columbia Mentoring Initiative, and a new student orientation program crew captain. In her senior year, she received the Edward S. Brainard Prize, Indelible Mark Award, and recognition as a senior marshal for her continued service and leadership to her peers, especially in the Arab community. Miriam received her Bachelor of Arts in Middle Eastern Studies and Anthropology and is currently pursuing a Master's of Global Affairs at Rice University while finishing her athletic career. So Paul, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adil. Um, that's a really wonderful way of starting off the program. Um, I want to wish everyone a good afternoon, a good evening, and a good morning to some of you on the West Coast, um, which Adil is calling us in from Vancouver. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick housekeeping. Um, again, my name is uh, Paul Lindbergh. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here in New York City, and we're so glad you're joining the KALE programs. Um, to have the best um, KALE viewing experience, we recommend you to have the speaker mode in Zoom. Um, there's the gallery mode and speaker mode, where currently you should be seeing me in speaker mode. Um, we recommend everyone to keep themselves muted during the program. If you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. We will have a portion of the program where you will be able to have questions and answers with the presenters in a larger peer-to-peer -peer conversation. And then finally, uh, it would be great to see, I see Ellen from Michigan is sending some nice messages to Joanna in the chat. It would be great if everyone could add in the chat um, some where you're actually um, dialing in from today on the Zoom, um, such as Adil from Vancouver, um, and then jo Joanna's in Poland. So if different people can add in where they're calling in from, and uh, Marianne is from, it's in New Jersey, I'll acknowledge uh, where everyone's calling in from. And I am here in Upper Manhattan enjoying myself. So if you want to add that in, at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Joanna to start us off with her personal 
CAA leadership story. Joanna? Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Joanna, as all of you already know. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's, I think, my uh, FARB uh, Columbia Leaders Weekend uh, and the first time online, and I'm very excited. Um, and I hope all of you are well and healthy despite what is going on right now. Um, so yeah, um, going into my leadership story, it, it began in 2016. So I graduated from the J school in 2015. And when I returned to Poland, I really wanted to be in touch with other Columbia graduates. And I knew that there weren't many um, graduates in Poland. So I was really excited about finding out what are other gradu Columbia graduates doing, doing here. So as I hung out with, with another graduate of Columbia who was at the time working in Poland, we were just chatting about how great it would be to just, you know, um, have this club and have this uh, opportunity to interact with uh, other uh, graduates. And so we started doing some research online and we discovered there was some, there used to be some club in Poland and, uh, you know, we, we found some email addresses to the previous leaders and we and we thought about reaching out to them. So we reach out to them. At first, we we didn't receive receive any any responses. And we posted a couple of, you know, posts online on different social media. And then um, another graduate reached out to us and she she's actually a board member right now. And she said that she would love to be engaged in reactivating the club as well. So that's, that's how we started like sort of the process of, uh, of just, you know, engaging ourselves. Um, and then we received some responses from the previous leaders and they said that uh, there was an informal club in Poland, but before, but because there was not enough people coming to events they they thought it wouldn't make sense to continue that you know with such a small small number of people but they said that um you know we can take it from there and and try to reactivate the club again and you know and um see see what happens then so it was amazing to actually receive their support and kind of like a blessing <laughs> to, to continue this, um, th this work. So we organized a general assembly and uh, we, the three of us, the three recent alumni, we became uh, a board members of the, of the new reactivated club. And we started uh, organizing events and actually um, it turned out to, to work well because we we started um, attracting people and so we in the first year we organized about 10 events and depending on the type of event we attracted between 5 to 25 people and I just wanted to say because maybe if some of you are from the larger clubs you might think that oh 20 or like 10 is not is not a lot, but actually for, for Poland, where we have approximately like 100 people that who read our email list, that's a lot, like 20 people or 25 people, it's actually a lot. So that was very exciting to, um, to see uh, graduates coming to our events, whether it was like a lecture or just, just like a get together or going to Vistula River or like, um, going for drinks or like happy hour or like an exhibit. So, uh, so it was very, so it was very uh, exciting. And uh, at every event, we, we saw some new faces um, and these were people from, you know, various generations. These were like both people who have graduated from Columbia recently. And these were people who graduated from the Columbia you know, in 70s or 80s. And this was, this was very exciting. So um, 
one of our previous, you know, uh, of our current board members at this, at this time in 2016, he, um, he came up with this idea of doing uh, a mentoring program and we, tr and we started to connect the, the younger alumni with the more experienced alumni, which was also great for our um, integration so that's how it started. And then we, um, so, so we started as a team of three board members and we were engaging about 20, about 20 alumni in Poland who were regularly coming to our events. But um, after some time, we decided to formalize the club and we uh, created a, a formal association uh, because we wanted to be perceived um, as you know, better partners for potential partners uh, because other other um, alumni association from other Ivy League schools or other universities, you know, in Europe they are usually formalized. So we decided to formalize the club, and uh, you know, and uh, then it generated some uh, challenges, and we found out that having three people on the board might not be enough. So we've had a situation last year when two out of three board members had to move abroad and I alone wasn't able to sign all the documents. I wasn't able to do anything actually because there needs to be at least two people, you know, signing any document in the bank or like signing any, a document in the card and so on. Mm, so that's when we realized that three people on the board is actually too, too little. So we decided to expand the board. And that's when we thought about, you know, engaging, engaging other alumni and recruiting them and encouraging the um, alumni, uh, the very active alumni to, to join our board. And right now we have seven people in the team, uh, so we can do more and our events uh, became more sophisticated. So for me personally, it has been an extraordinary journey so far. Um, and, and there are so many things I, I've learned and I'm still learning, like uh, what makes a successful event or how to engage other leaders, how to keep track uh, of you know, the club's goals. Uh, how to use help of other engaged leaders. Uh, so I'm really excited and I'm grateful for that opportunity. So that is how, how it all happened from my side. And I'm wondering what Mariam, Mariam's experience is. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I think that was a really wonderful way to start off. And also to, on your points, um, engaging 20 or 30% of your population um, is a really impressive amount, I think, to understand if any, any one of our alumni populations, if you're able to engage 20 or 30 percent of the people, if it's 100 people or if it's 1,000 people, that is impressive, especially over time, because people keep on coming back to your different events. So kudos to you. I um, look forward to hearing your insights on alumni leaders. So Marianne, would you like to share um, your CAA personal leadership story? Gladly. Um, first of all, thank you for everyone who's here. I hope everyone's safe and well in this really ridiculous year that we're having. Um, but I think it's moments like these where we can touch base back to Columbia that, you know, kind of bring us a little bit closer to home and make us feel a little bit more level. Uh, so my name is Mary Hassan. I just graduated in May, so I'm a little fresh to the alumni world. And I'm the co-founder of the Columbia Arab Alumni Association. As of this Saturday, we will be a year old from our first event. And the way this all kind of started was in roughly May of 2019, a classmate of mine who was Barnard class of 2020 kind of threw around this idea of let's have an Arab graduation. We wanted an identity-based graduation. And that eventually evolved into, well, what if we take it a step further and form an Arab alumni association and extend that as part of it? When we both came to Columbia, we had gotten into the school, we were really excited and we knew that we wanted to find the Arab communities there. And as an undergraduate, you know, identity is a really, really big piece of how you find your setting, how you find your footing and who you become close to. So as we went through Columbia, we found ourselves kind of gravitating towards those Arab circles. 
And the more we gravitated towards them, the more we wanted to help them grow and help them build. Rahmat later became the president of Turath, which is the undergraduate Arab, <clears throat> excuse me, undergraduate Arab Students Association. And I was the co-chair of the Columbia Mentoring Initiative for the Arab Middle Eastern Family Tree. And the more that we did for those programs, we wanted to continue to make sure that those relationships held strong. Um, not just for the undergraduates, but for undergraduates trying to connect with graduate students, graduate students trying to connect with alumni. And we decided in June of 2019 to kind of start delving into how do we actually get this moving? How do we connect Arab alumni from every class, every school, and every country? Because we knew that there were so many more Arab alum that just weren't, we weren't able to connect with them. And we knew that there was a network there that we wanted to reach, and we wanted to bring that, that community together. So we started those conversations in June of 2019 uh, while Rahma was in California and I was in Egypt and Colombia obviously is in New York. So nine hour time difference uh, conference calls made for a very interesting start. But when we were all finally back in New York, we started reaching out to people that we knew were involved in the Arab community as undergrads. We knew they were involved as graduate students in one way or another. Um, and as we started getting more people interested, as we started getting names, we started reaching out to people to try and begin formulating our board. And one of the women that we reached out to, Khadija Abdel Nebi, who currently runs a female-led graphic design studio in Erbil, Iraq, um, was so excited by the prospect of an Arab Alumni Association that she hopped on a Zoom call with us at 3 a.m. her time. Um, and that was just, that was how strong the project resonated with her. So we kept writing those emails, we kept reaching out, and eventually finally formulated our board of about seven or eight of us. And now the board is around 10 people. And as we continue to build that board, the more people we talk to, every time we talk to somebody new, we were trying to dig a little bit further deeper into what was Arab life at Columbia like for you? And how can we support that more, more firmly uh, as an organization? I recently spoke to an alum from GSAS class of 98, and he was talking about how Arab community there was very it was very different because it was mostly international students. There weren't as many Arab American students in attendance at the university, but they kept bringing that constituency back together. And he kept talking about that feeling of camaraderie and that community that we wanted to continue to build. The more people we spoke to, the more the stories sounded very, very similar. And now as we're about a year in, we have a fairly solidified board and this board is reaching the end of its tenure as we finish bylaws and we continue to think about how we wanna plan for the future and how we wanna continue setting the right routes. Um, we keep talking with people who have all these ideas. They wanna hold conferences. We wanna do mentoring initiatives. We want to be able to spotlight once a month uh, individuals within the community around the world who are doing big things. And we, every conversation we've had, we know that this is, this is something that will continue to grow because there's a demand for it. Uh, we hosted an Arab graduation this past June. In spite of, you know, all the chaos in the world, it was still, we still felt it was important to host a graduation. And we had roughly 80 people attend with a keynote speaker of Rashid Khalidi, who is a history professor at Columbia. The fact that we were really able to garner that much support and we got so much positive feedback at the end of it we knew there was a demand. We knew that as students continue to graduate from Columbia, from this community, that it will in fact continue to grow. And we're really excited for the future of it. This Sunday, we're hosting an event on Zoom, of course, um, with artists from around the Arab world on how art impacts representation during political conflict. And we felt it was even more relevant as you know the political tides are turning both in the United States and around the world. We're really excited about the future of all this. And for me, as a kid who grew up in a very small homogenous town, um, it was really exciting to find the Arab community at Columbia. And now as we move forward to really be able to help it build and help it grow into something that can support kids 10, 20, 15 years, uh, however many years out from now, we're really excited about the prospect of, you know, what is it that connects Columbia Arabs together and how do we keep building that in the future? So that's our story. That's that's how we started. And now a year later, we're really, really excited about the number of people who really want to be involved in the Arab community at Columbia and just how much they want to see it grow and thrive. Thank you, Miriam. And I, I think your story um, underlines how it's so important to have a pipeline between student life um, into alumni life and connecting those two sides. And I know we're going to speak about insights on recruiting leaders and things like that. And I think both of your stories on 
either side from the sort of global club Poland experience versus the, in the Arab Alumni um, Association experience. I think they're they're both good examples on either side, and it's it's about you know really trying to serve that community. So I want to transition to Joanna now to share about your insights on recruiting uh, leaders. Yeah. So um, at first it was easy because there were there were just the three of us, and we basically recruited ourselves <laughs> and became the board members. So uh, we had the three person board for a few years. Um, but what's interesting, we, um, we, of course, we got support of the, of, the previous, of the previous leaders and some of them were on our advisory board. So it was great that we, you know, kept in touch with the, with the previous leaders and they were supporting us. Uh, but after after a few years, when we realized that the three people on the board is is too little, uh, and we decided to uh, enlarge the, the board and recruit new board members, we were we were primarily looking at active club members who often com come to our events, who share feedback, who ask questions, who share new ideas. So we, after the events, we often reach out to them privately and we were encouraging them to basically apply for a bird position when, when the general assembly comes. So this is exactly what we did uh, a year ago when we decided to expand the board. And um, at the end of 2019, we had this, uh, we had this uh, event with, with one of Columbia graduates, he is a famous a professor in Poland and a famous lawyer. And um, it was interesting even because it was after a few months of kind of trying to make this club work with only one person from the board being present in Poland. So I personally was terrified, <laughs> you know, what is going to happen because there were many formal things that I couldn't finalize because there was just, there was just me. So uh, when the event happened, I, um, I talked to everyone, I said what, what the challenges are, and I basically encouraged, you know, the people that were attending the event to, to consider applying to the board in the, in the future. Mm, and and yeah and uh, luckily some of them were very excited about joining the board and these were people who were actually active for already for some time uh, but they weren't on board uh, basically and these were some of them were very senior um, experienced alumni who are um, who have you know great professional careers so um, it was also it was also good, I think, for the club because um, when we were starting out, we were starting out as this free free recent graduates, and we um, we didn't have such um, you know large network of contacts. So we thought, okay, if we if we have more experienced um, alumni on the board, they can also you know help us to make the events more sophisticated. So that's what happened at the beginning of 2020, just before, you know, all the pandemic, we, we had a in-person uh, general assembly and we uh, recruited uh, new board members and we have uh, seven, seven engaged and experienced members on the board right now. And what's interesting, some of them are the same people that were, you know, starting the club many, many years ago informally. So, uh, so that's very exciting. So my key tips uh, on recruiting leaders would be keep in touch with, with the most engaged alumni. Uh, alumni. Mm, I would also say uh, observe and interact with the alumni at the events. Uh, this, this year, of course, we had to move all of our events online. So it's not really possible to have this true interaction, but still like um, reaching out and just sending email and, you know, responding to emails. It's, it's very important to 
whose thought, you know, particularly active um, um, club members and potentially leaders in the future. I would also say, say yes to their ideas related to organizing an event. So we've had several instances when someone who is not on the board reach out to us and said, okay, I'm, I'm right now in, the touch, in touch with Jeffrey Sachs and he's going to come to Poland. So what do you think about organizing event and him being a keynote speaker? So we never say no <laughs> to such, uh, to such uh, you know, um, ideas. Uh, and, you know, potentially these people who came up with such ideas might, might become uh, board members one day. Uh, I would also say engage recent alumni, uh, alumni as these are people who have this fresh perspective. Um, they are out of university. And I remember from my own experience that when I came back to Poland, I was really just so eager to meet other alumni and network with them. So uh, I had this, uh, you know, huge <laughs> uh, excitement and, uh, you know, and time. And I, I guess I had, I, I had more time than, you know, people who are, um, who are very experienced and are working, you know, at high positions in corporations. And my last piece of advice would be be active on social media because it's the way uh, to promote uh, the events and the club and attract new alumni uh, and potentially new board members. And from my own experience, I very often receive emails from uh, new Columbia graduates. I receive um, messages on social media. They reach out to me on LinkedIn or they reach out to me on, uh, on Facebook, sometimes even on Instagram. So they don't necessarily um, uh, send me uh, messages uh, on my email, even though it's available online, <laughs> but they somehow prefer to reach me out, uh, reach, reach to me for social media. So I think, um, being active on social media helps to attract uh, new people. So that's that's it for me. Thank you, Joanna. That's that's some really good insights there. Um, I will compliment Joanna because I joined a um, social event that they had for Poland, and they had some people from Poland on the call, but also a woman who was in England, um, who was based out of Cambridge, um, someone from New York, which is myself another gentleman from Cleveland, who was a professor in Polish studies, someone in California, and then someone else who was also in Hawaii, um, all on the same call. So I think it's really impressive to see the, the breadth of that sort of diaspora of the Poland community that, you know, Joanna's work with so many different people, maybe even if they're not in Poland at the time, but they're really affinity for the virtual program. So kudos to the, all the work that you've done uh, cultivating people from diverse groups from recent alumni to across all different age spectrums. Um, Miriam, would you like to share about your insights on recruiting leaders? Gladly. Um, so I think I have a, a slightly unique perspective on this just because I am so fresh out of school. Um, when it comes to recruiting leaders in Columbia as, as their time as students, I think it makes a very big difference as to what their experiences as students were. And you know, if you look back on your experience while you were while you were a student, you as an alumni leader, if you look back on that time, you know who the active members were, you know who really wanted to be involved and who was at all the events. Uh, myself and, the, our, and my co-founder, both being class of 2020, we knew the people who were really, really involved, and we know the people that will hopefully eventually be more involved in the Arab community afterwards. Uh, one of the biggest pieces we found in getting people more involved where either they were missing something in their experience as students and they wanted to help cultivate it more for others or they had amazing experiences as students and wanted to continue that trend. Uh, so we do, we do a lot of outreach with people who we know were involved in the Columbia Mentoring Initiative in Turoth. SIPA has a, I believe it's a MENA group, Middle East North African, uh, and we find a lot of people who are involved in that are also getting involved we were recently, like Joanna said, people who reach out with ideas for things, uh, support them, help, help them figure out ways of doing it. We had a GSAP class of 17 alum with a group of five or six other students that graduated or near or around him who want to host a conference, who want to host a panel on art and architecture in the Arab world and how it's changing. 
uh, through conflict, through war, uh, and how to preserve it. So there are all these pieces, all these people who had done all these things, who had studied all this stuff while they were students that they want to bring it into the alumni uh, sphere. So looking at projects that people are doing, looking at who's engaging with the social media, like Joanna said, you know, we're trying to up that social media presence. We're trying to make sure that more and more people know what we are, what we're doing. And then on top of it is the outreach part, right? Making sure that people are aware of what we're doing, but making sure that you're also engaging with those same people. You know, okay, they're engaging with that material. How do we help them find ways of getting involved? Making sure that we have people who, if they've made it clear they wanna be a part of the board later, keeping those people engaged as well. We've had so many people email us and say, well, what about this? What about this event? Can we, can we have this conversation? Will you have more mixtures, more art-based events? Will there be another graduation for the class of 2021? And these are all things that we're keeping track of. To build the alumni leaders is to look at the people who are frequently involved, who are frequently looking at ideas and want to actively contribute. Because we're still so young and there isn't as much of a face-to-face -face component because of the pandemic, it becomes a little bit trickier, but we're, you know, we're tracking through our nation builder, we're tracking who's opening the emails, how many people, um, and we get like 70% of people open our email. Great, okay, how many, clicks, how many clicks are we getting? How many people are registering for events? Uh, and how much feedback are we getting? Our biggest thing right now is looking at people who are engaging with us, why they're engaging with us and doing the outreach and the due diligence to continue to draw people in so that we continue to set the basis for, um, for involvement. I was an undergrad and I kept getting involved in these things. And I looked at the people around me who kept getting involved in the Arab, Arab Student Association who, who wanted to do more. Those were the people that ended up becoming the leaders. Khadija Abdel Nebi was the former president of Turath. Omar Abouds, who is also one of our board members, was a former president of Turath. Those people who were frequently involved were the ones that ended up reaching out to us a lot and who had a lot of input on that. So for leadership initiatives, for reaching out to others, I think my biggest tip is look at the students who are actively doing things whether they're graduate students, med students. We actually had a med student reach out to us about helping organize an Arab graduation on campus in the medical campus. Um, so that's somebody that we're actively engaging with as well. Look at the people who want to make change while they're students because they'll want to do more while they're alum as well. Granted, it gets a little bit trickier uh, because you know jobs get in the way, life gets in the way, but we know that that passion is still there. It's still, it's still, there's still a flame there. There's still an ember and you wanna try and help it grow to help engage everybody, as many people as you can. So those, are, those would be my biggest things. Keep engaging in social media, like Joanna said, and keep looking at the people who are frequently active. Keep looking at ways to engage the community. And as a result of the engagement, people will come to you and continue to want to be active in the community. Thank you, Maryam. Uh, and 70% opens uh, email rates. I was, I, I, my mouth went wide open. 70% is really impressive. So I think that we normally get a, I think- We were 30, shocked too. <laughs> I think 30 to 40% was something that we looked for. Um, I wanna just open it up, um, you know, thank the two presenters so far and open it up for questions. Um, people can um, unmute themselves and ask a question if they'd like. Um, or you can put it in the chat if you prefer to use that format, but we'd like to have it be an open forum right now. Anyone have any questions? And I have some questions too, if no, everyone's pretty shy. Um, as people are formulating some of their ideas, I had a question that came up in another kill session asking about how to cultivate uh, leaders in the new virtual space. Um, you know, we all know how we interact with people in person and how we might uh, leverage people when we're meeting, but do you, does uh, Joanna or Miriam, do you have any ideas about how to really understand that in the new virtual space? How does it work? Have you had any experiences? I, I would say it's, it's very difficult. Um, I, I, I personally uh, have Zoom fatigue and I try to actually avoid uh, Zoom meetings when I can, um, uh, especially because of my job, because I'm a journalist, so I, I'm making a lot of phone calls every day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say 
compliment compliment people say they are doing you know you know for example recently we've organized um a zoom meeting with the former prime minister uh, of poland uh, magek belka he is also uh, a colombia graduate so um so it was interesting and a successful event many many people many people attended so after after the event we we shared you know among among the board members we uh, we share feedback from the event and we said what we liked about the event and what we personally each of us did to make this event happen and we like thank each other so i think complimenting and thanking each other is a good way to like uh keep the spirits up and um be motivated for the future events yeah i absolutely agree i think keeping the board engaged is a really big piece of keeping positive efforts going out engaging people over zoom and through the internet right now is really hard uh, but I think if you think about formulating events that will compel people to really get involved, you know, if you if you think about formulating events on Zoom that people will willingly sit in front of their computer for an hour for, because people have job meetings, class meetings, everything is on the internet right now just by the nature of where we are in the world. So by finding things that people will actually engage with, willingly take time out of their day, I think that's how you consistently continue to build, even though everything right now feels like it's at a complete standstill. Uh, but Joanna is very much right in that the more you support the board, the easier it becomes to garner good work out of each other. Um, you know, at least once a week, one of us will drop in our group chat of like, I really appreciate you guys. The work that you're doing is, is amazing. And I'm really proud to be a part of this group. And I think it's positive reinforcement like that, that helps us to continue to stay motivated, even though, you know, like I've never met some of my board members in person, which is really, really weird. But, you know, every two weeks we sit down, we have a board meeting and we, we have a heart to heart and we figure out what to do next, but we're all motivated to keep doing that. Um, Zoom sucks. We, we know Zoom is far from ideal, but for us at least as a transatlantic and international group that, you know, we've got alumni all over the world, it makes it a lot easier to engage people that we never would have been able to engage before. We had, in our graduation, we had students who were in Tunisia, we had students in Egypt, we had students in Iraq and Turkey, kids everywhere, and the fact that we were able to really present them with this opportunity to celebrate their graduation in a unique way, despite all the chaos, I think brings everything back um, to a moment of center. So if we can find ways to continue to find moments of center, even though it's not the ideal form, the little things that connect you back to the campus community, connect you back to the things that make you feel like a Columbia student, even if it's just you know, a little hangout over Zoom, I think it helps to bring everybody together in that capacity of, you know, it's still a community. You know, we might be spread apart. We might not be able to see each other and hug each other. And, you know, for Arabs, it's a lot of hugging and shay, you know, a lot of tea. We can't do that right now, but this is the next best thing. And at least we can see each other's faces and continue to engage. Thank you for answering that, um, that question. I think that's an important uh, issue that people are trying to deal with right now. And uh, I, I heard once someone say, uh, I think this is from the alumni office, the alumni affairs office saying that people um, always remember, um, actually remember the people that forget to thank people, not the people that do do thank you. So if you have, a, I don't know, if you're sending out wed wedding thank yous and you forget to send out the wedding thank yous to the one person, they're gonna remember that. So it's always important to thank people or overthank them in, uh, in many ways. Um, I think those are some really good tips. We had a question from uh, Shelly Smith. Uh, would you like to, to ask, your question directly to the to everyone. Um, if not, there we go. I was go. just uh, trying to find on my iPad. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if um, either of you had any ideas about actually holding the annual membership meeting uh, required to elect uh, board members for the next term. Um, I've been trying a couple of methods, but uh, wanted to see if, if you guys had bylaws that, uh, that required you to um, have an annual membership meeting where you elected, uh, you know, either the current slate or took nominations or, or 
uh, expressions of interest and then had a vote and whether whether you had had to do that during COVID, if you had any ideas to do that. So actually, um, in case of the Columbia Club of Poland, um, we managed to uh, conduct the, the last General Assembly just before the pandemic. So we were lucky because according to Polish law, we are not, um, it's not possible to have the General Assembly online and we cannot choose the members online. So, so we were lucky and unfortunately I don't have any advice uh, okay. on how to on how to do this online if the law requires the, the members to be to be there in person. But if if the law doesn't require require it, then I would say just you know organize a Zoom meeting or um, yeah, a teams a Teams meeting on or Google Hangouts, if it's if it's legally possible. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I, I think to your question, Shelley, and I know that I work with you um, on this, that the group in Houston um, has had to do something similar. They have uh, some type of email survey that they send out where people are are voting on things and then the person takes everything together. So they do very similar to what they would uh, make a board in lieu of meeting in person. So I think that there's some ways, but you might have to look at your bylaws to see what the actual rules are, but this could be in lieu of that. Um, but I'm happy to follow up with you after on it because I think it's an important um, logistical thing in this new COVID world <laughs> where we all have yeah. to do everything over Zoom. And, and I know that you want to do everything in the proper uh, legal way. Yeah, we, we've recently revised our bylaws and, and my idea right now is just uh, I've given notice for a Zoom meeting for the annual uh, membership meeting where people are going to, you know, hopefully we'll have a quorum and people will vote uh, you know, on the chat, uh, but, but, but I'm trying to figure out if there's anything that I can do other than, than do that. So, so if you could put me in touch with the Houston member, that would be great. Sure, happy to do that. Um, I, I also see Jeffrey um, Franklin has asked a question about, um, Jeffrey, would you like to ask your question to the, to the group? Sure, um, in the current environment, um, how do you deal with the need for two or more signatures from board members if your board members are geographically dispersed? Mm -hmm. So in our case, uh, we just uh, use the post office and we, send, uh, and we send the documents from one board member to another to sign it. So all the, so um, the headquarters of the club in the, in case of the Columbia Club of Poland is my apartment so i have all the documents so basically whenever we need to to have two signatures on any document we just pass it from one another so i don't know someone someone can just drive by and just leave the documents you know um, at the door or uh, yeah or send it by post in our case okay. thank you Great, um, thank you, Joanna. Um, I think I want to just open it up. Also, if anyone has any comments, um, I I, th I see a message from Constantina. Thank you for uh, yeah, engagement. Hello. Yeah, Hi. Um, yeah, really inspiring talks from the girls. Thank you so much for that. Um, I found actually quite interesting the um, international. Um, uh, feeling of, of of a local club so <laughs> that's an idea <laughs> because um, Greeks are um, everywhere in, in the world and uh, it's it's always hard to get people coming back to to Greece after they've studied at Colombia so it could be an idea to to keep some people engaged with our club even though they're <laughs> in a in a different part of the world because of their nationality. So thank you for that idea. Um, just a small tip as well from a long uh, story of uh, engaging with the, the board member of uh, Colombia. Um, I think a key point is um, 
keeping the engagement, which is very hard. Uh, when 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 a seven people board, um, they all have um, their personal lives and work uh, responsibilities um, to keep um, to keep it alive and to keep um, your original, uh, so to say, uh, responsibilities to the club uh, alive. I think it's most crucial and. Uh, uh for the the good communication but also the right mix of people so you definitely need uh, a, t a lawyer <laughs> uh, for um, to keeping the, um, the paperwork you definitely need someone to be on a marketing uh, and sales um, channel so that they're good with social media and engagement so you need a mix of people people that are good in fundraising or people that know um you know high-end uh, profiles of uh, uh, entrepreneurs or, or speakers so i think a, a good mix is always key as well that was just my point <laughs> thank you Thank you, Constantina. I think, I think that's uh, some really great points about how we have to have a diverse groups. And then, you know, sometimes people think about, I mean, I think the journalism alumni might be people who are saying, oh, they're going to be good at marketing. Um, but I think there's a diverse group of people from different schools as well um, with different types of skills. Um, also, the Columbia College um, alumni are also across many different groups. Um, and I know that we have some uh, engineering alumni here on the call who are always, I always feel like they're very good at the tech things, but then it's good to sort of think on both sides. So some great, some great points there. Um, I wanted to open it up if anyone else has, I know this is one of the final programs for Kale. Um, we have some, a program of Battle and Albright this coming Saturday, but if anyone has any other takeaways from the, any of the other Kale programs that you'd like to share with the larger group or just general conversation, general questions. I see that there is some some one more question from Janet uh, in the chat area. Janet, would you like to ask the question? I, I know that I've heard from you a few few of the programs in Kale. Yeah, this uh, I, I'd like to hear from each of you, Joanna and Miriam, about possibly extending your reach to non-alumni Columbia groups, especially when you have a prestigious speaker where it would really draw more attention to the club and to Columbia University and also expand our network outside the school. Uh, thanks for commenting in advance. Love this presentation. So yeah, so that's um, that's a very interesting question. So actually, in in case of Jeffrey Sachs, uh, when he came to Poland, we decided to open this event uh, up for Harvard uh, alumni as well. <laughs> Of course, we prefer Columbia, but uh, we were open to have the Harvard alumni uh, to see the event as well. Uh, so um, yeah, we, we, we keep in touch with other uh, board members of other Ivy League clubs and not just Ivy Leagues, also different business schools in the US and in, um, in Europe and um, we also keep in touch with the with the leaders of uh, some universities in uh, in France, and we, whenever there is uh, there is an event that we think we could open up for non non Columbia uh, groups, we we just do it. We invite we we encourage the board members of other um, associations or clubs to send the emails, invitations to their members. And uh, that's how it works. Um, it's easy, fast, and uh, yeah, and brings many, many new people to the event. Yeah, Joanna, I love that you guys were able to do the event um, with the former prime minister of Poland, you said. Uh, right now, this is actually a conversation, I love this question, because this is a conversation that we've had so many times with our board of brand awareness. How do we get more people to know who is the Columbia Arab Alumni Association? What are we doing? Who's involved? And what's the plan? 
So with the event that we're hosting on Sunday about art and representation amid crisis, you know, one of our, our, our moderator is a Columbia alum who I believe is an adjunct faculty in the arts department as a photography teacher. Uh, and the other three are renowned artists in the Arab world. So when we thought about how do we engage more people outside of this, we want as many people to know about this as possible. We want more people to come to these events just through the outreach, right? One of the presenters is, one of the panelists, his name is El Cid, who is world renowned for his calligraphy in various parts, in Paris, uh, Tunisia. He even did a piece in Philadelphia. But one of the things that we really, really focused on when we continue to have these board meetings, it always comes up is, how do we engage more people outside of Columbia with the brand? Uh, because Harvard, Harvard's Arab Alumni Association is I believe 15 or 20 years old now. And every year they host this massive conference with easily a few thousand people in attendance. Uh, our goal is to get to something like that, but we can't do that without further engaging more people outside of it. In our planning stages, not even, not even just for this event, but for um, when, we, when we were building the board and thinking about, okay, how do we find funding? How do we get to a place, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we get to a place where we can hold a conference of that capacity? Part of that is building the network of meeting more people outside of the Columbia realm. The more people you know, the more you'll be able to advertise, the more people can send it out. Um, so, you know, our, all of our panelists have now sent event information to people that they know outside of the Columbia circle. And like Joanna said, it's really about engagement. It's, it's about reaching out and playing the network game of, okay, hi, Harvard, here's our event. We'd love to have you in attendance. Reaching out to professors at Columbia, reaching out to people in places like MPAC, Muslim Public Affairs Council, you know, they've got connections in various places. And it allows more people to, to really engage with the community and the material. And in the long run, it allows us to have those connections to build those mentoring initiatives that we hope to build, to allow the brand to speak for itself more than us having to explain it. We hope to get to a place where CAAA is just known. People hear the Columbia Arab Alumni Association and it, the brand speaks for itself. They know what it is, who's running it, what it's doing and why it's important. Thanks, Miriam. I think, and Joanna, those are two very good comments. Um, I would also add on to, to comment for Janet's um, question. You know, in, in a worldwide space, and this is what we're running into with the kale programs right now, we have a program at 8 a.m. this morning, we have a program at noon, and we have a program at 6 p.m. Um, and the people that are in the metro New York area, we have a default towards 6 or 7 p.m. for different programs. Um, and the reason why we have three different time zones is this noon time slot is, a real, is an evening time in our, for our friends in Europe where we have people from Poland and Sweden and Greece, many different groups of people. And the 8 a.m. call was acknowledging the people um, in Asia and then also people maybe in advance of the workday. Um, I know a colleague who works in the business school who hosts um, breakfast uh, talks with different thought leaders because in the business community, it's easier to get people to speak at eight o'clock in the morning, but it also works with the business leaders who are based in Asia. So I think one of the restrictions we do have um, is timing around the world. If you're doing something at 7 p.m. at night, I don't think Joanna is going to really be tuning in because she might be sleeping at that time. So kind of understanding where different groups of people are um, and trying to be inclusive uh, with the sort of time with the timing as well. Um, as we're getting close to the end here, I really want to thank again, I know a deal had to leave a little early, um, but I want to thank everyone for joining today. I want to leave the last word uh, for Joanna and Miriam, if you would like to leave any final final thoughts with us and then we'll close out the program. So Joanna, would you like to start? Uh, final, final thoughts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> stay safe, stay healthy and uh, stay positive. <laughs> That's my final thoughts. Thank you. And Maria? Um, thank you everybody for who's here, uh, for listening to my very junior self speaking. I think as the Columbia community continues to adapt to this really, really weird setting, uh, it's definitely important to make sure that we're practicing self-care and you know, check in on people. Don't, don't neglect yourself. Uh, if you're in the New York area, it is a beautiful day outside. Go outside, get some fresh air. But uh, you know, don't, don't focus everything on Zoom. There's, Zoom eventually will end and we have to look past the time when Zoom is over and we can be in person again and live life semi-normally again. So I hope everybody takes care, stays well. 
um, and stay safe in this really, really weird time that we live in. Thanks, Miriam. Um, and we'll leave the last words for Shelley Smith from the chat. She said, wisdom, wealth, and work is all you need for a good board. Many thanks to the presenters. So thank you, everyone. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening, a wonderful afternoon, and hope to see all of you in person very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.